Amen. Well, we're talking about intimacy with Jesus, and today we'll talk about a reckless abandon. Being a disciple has to do, it has to do, it has to be both. You, it has to be caught and it has to be taught. So the catching bit is where you have an encounter, is where you have an experience, where you know you are in an intimate relation. That can only be caught. The rest we've been teaching a lot. Intimacy with Christ is caught. It's not taught. There is no method. I can tell you these are the three steps to see Christ. I can give you five, uh, five points. I can give you three points. I can give you ten points on how. But I can tell you that once there is faith in you, once the word of God is preached, once you see the reality of who he is, you can catch on to it. The wise men from the east wanted to see Jesus, the king of kings and the king of the Jews. Some did not seek him. We know that Herod and the religious were busy studying the methods how he would come. Couldn't see that those methods are irrelevant because he's here. They missed their day of visitation because they were absorbed in things that were irrelevant. They were talking about Christ and not talking to him. All who sought him, we said they found him. And then, you know, when there is that abandonment, when you have Andrew and you have John, and John the Baptist points at Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God. And Andrew and John says, We are done with you. John the Baptist, we are done with you. We are going after the Lamb of God, and we are leaving you. That is the beginning of a reckless abandon. When you leave certain situations, when you leave certain relationships and certain places because you want to be with Jesus. Matthew, if you remember, was converted at work. According to his resume, his profile on the internet, this was, or when you Googled him at that time, his resume was that he was a revenue consultant for the government, the Roman government. According to his neighbors, according to the tabloids of that time, he was a crook. Didn't matter to Jesus that Matthew was a thief. He knew it. Didn't matter to Jesus that Matthew had built a double-story house with the proceeds of extortion. Didn't matter. Didn't matter. When, if Jesus walked into here today, he wouldn't do an interrogation of all of us because he would know that the clothes you're putting on, you bought them with money that was... He, he would know that the way you build your wealth, he, he would know that the way you've been relating, he, and all that. But for Jesus, when you meet him, there's a reckless abandon. He doesn't care because he's more worried about your soul than what you have. Now, religion tells us that we must worry about what we have. Because religion believes that you must take with you what you have. That's why the Egyptians, in, their, I mean, their, in, the, in the olden uh, customs, they used to bury their pharaohs, their rulers, with all the diamonds, the gold, the, the treasures with them. Because they sincerely believed that they must, this must go with them. That's what religion does. What did matter was that Matthew wanted to know Jesus, and since God rewards those who truly want to find him, Matthew was rewarded with the presence of Christ in his home. Of course, it only made sense that Jesus spent time with Matthew. After all, Matthew was to write the first book of the New Testament. Jesus is coming and saying, look, first have an encounter with me then all these things that you're concerned about begin to drop from you because you are focused on me. Our problem is that we want to sort ourselves out before we have an encounter with Christ. It is impossible. You're going to be frustrated. The embezzler just didn't want salvation. But he wanted the Savior. I want us to understand one thing. We can be so caught up in salvation. Jesus did not just come 
to do a transaction with us, you are saved. Period. Jesus wanted to go beyond salvation. That we have a relationship with him. But that relationship goes through his blood. Goes through him. But we cannot continuously say, as long as I'm saved, that's fine. It is more than salvation. He wanted a savior. He wanted, a, he wanted the savior himself. He didn't want salvation. He wanted the savior. So he invited fellow crooks. He says, guys, this is our turn. We found somebody who we can relate with. He said, follow me. What about Zacchaeus? Talking about reckless abandon here. What about Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was small. <laughs> so small that you couldn't see over the crowd that lined the street the day Jesus came to Jericho. Of course, the crowd might have lent, let him elbow up to the front, except that he, like Matthew, was a tax collector. But he, like Matthew, had a hunger in the heart for Jesus. There is a certain hunger for people who know they are not worth it when they begin to seek the heart of God. What a reckless abandon. The extortionist of the city cared less about the humiliation of being seen in a tree. He couldn't care less. He wanted to see this Christ. What about the rich young ruler? You've heard that story about the rich young ruler? Here is Matthew 19, verse 16 to 22. Here's what it says. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbors as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when the young man heard what, uh, that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. There are those of us, when they want to see Jesus, is they see Jesus as a painkiller. We see him as a source to just resolve our problems, and that's it. Once our problems are fixed, we'll call on him whenever we need him. This is the rich young ruler. He saw Jesus as a painkiller. Let's, let's analyze that whole portion of scripture. Upon learning that Jesus was in the area, he called for his limo. He called for his chariot. And he cruised across town and says, yeah, we're going across. I hear there's this guy called Jesus. He's a rabbi. A lot of people respect him. And he approached the carpenter. Please note that the question that he had for Jesus was, Teacher, what good thing must I do to have life forever? Bottom line sort of kind of fella this ruler is. Get to the point quickly. I'm here. I know you're busy. And you know I'm busy. Now let's get to the issue. The issue here is that I want to have life forever. Because I want to enjoy this life that I have. So I want to know how do I keep this thing that I have got. So there are those who want to maintain a certain lifestyle beyond even now. There was nothing wrong with his question. But there was a problem with his heart. Can you see the difference in questioning? And Matthew says, can you spend the evening with us? Can you have dinner with us? Simeon says, can I still be alive after seeing you? The wise man would, say, would probably be telling their, their camels, please hurry, we need to see the Savior. And the shepherds would say, let's go and see this that was promised by the Lord. See the difference? The rich young ruler wanted medicine. He wanted a fix, a quick fix. The others wanted the physician himself. They weren't actually necessarily asking for healing. But they said, because we know who you are, we want you. 
Because in the event that we are sick, you will heal us. In the event that we are wandering off, you will get us back. In the event that we sin, you will cleanse us. In the event, whatever it was, they sought the healer, the physician, whilst the rich young ruler wanted just a quick fix and a medicine. Now, this is where the problems are in the body of Christ and in the church at large, in the, na the nations at large. What people are looking for in churches is they want a quick fix. But too many rich young rulers. They're looking for this. They're looking for this help. They're looking for this. Uh, this is where the, the whole prosperity model hangs around. It's because they say, look, just come to Jesus so that you can get this fix. Come to Jesus so that you can get your house. Come to Jesus so that you can get a husband. Come to Jesus so that you can get a wife. All that will be possible only if your desire wasn't to get a house. That your desire wanted to be with the one who brings houses. Now, we have even moved. We're not even saying come to Jesus. We're saying come to the man of God so that you can have a house. Come to the man of God so that you can be healed. Come to the man of God so that you can have abundance. Come to the man of God so that you can have a wife or a husband. Come to the man of... We no longer, we have actually blocked the physician. The ruler wanted an answer to a quiz. How do you fix this? How do you... How do you... <laughs> Tell me, Jesus, how do you... I, I want to sustain this life. But because you have no time, I have no time. How do I have... Life everlasting. But they wanted the teacher. He was in a hurry, this rich young ruler. They had all the time in the world. The other guys. They, they abandoned everything and prioritized Christ as their focal point. So finally, the final mark is where, is where you begin to focus so much on Christ at the very thing that you try and preserve every day. Do you know what we try and preserve every day? It's life. That's a final reckless abandon where you say, I'm prepared to die for this. Paul did the same. Agabus said, you know, he tied him and he said, you, this is what's going to happen to you. In fact, they're going to kill you when you get to Jerusalem. And, and, and he says, look, that's my joy. I'm going there. All these apostles we speak so highly about, some were burned, some were hung upside down, some were decapitated. Only John seems to have died kind of a, a reasonably sober death, but blind at the island of Potmos. Potmos. So there we are. What is it that we are prepared to finally die for? That's the question I leave with you. Because that's going to define who we are in Christ.